Okay, so hello everyone to today's uh, IAMP One World Mathematical Physics Seminar. Uh, it's a great pleasure to introduce um, today's speaker, Vojkan Jakšić from McGill University. And Vojkan will tell us about approach to equilibrium in translation invariant quantum systems, uh, some structural results. And let me say that uh, as usual, the seminar will be recorded and <clears throat> made available on our YouTube channel. And having said that, I'm very happy to leave the floor to Vojkan. Well, thank you very much, Marcello. Thanks to the organizers for inviting me to speak for the talk. The work I will talk about is a joint work with Caudalon and Clement Tauber. So let me start the talk with a statement that is known as the zero's law of thermodynamics. So most textbooks primarily discuss the first law, which can be summarized as conservation of energy, and the second law, which is increase of entropy. Now the zero's law is also a fundamental experimental fact basic to all thermodynamic description and is often implicitly assumed. So here is the formulation, now I have to check, that I have learned as a graduate student from my PhD at Barry Simon. One can find, of course, uh, many other same formulation or similar formulations in many other places in the literature, for example, in Ullenbeck and Ford's lectures in statistical mechanics or in jo Joel Leibovitz's papers on Boltzmann's entropy and error of time. So let me read the statement. So the zero law deals with the observed fact that a large system seems to normally have states described by a few microscopic parameters, like a temperature and density, and that any system not in one of these states left alone rapidly approaches one of these states. When Boltzmann and Gibbs tried to find a microscopic basis for thermodynamics, they realized that the approach to equilibrium was the most puzzling and deepest problem in such a formalism. So that is on page 17, Statistical Mechanics of Lattice Gases, so very, which I was proofreading when I was a graduate student before it was published. So this is obviously a fundamental problem, and one should be happy to say any, anything meaningful about it. So in addressing this problem, one needs to decide first on the physical and mathematical setting and choose between classical, quantum, continuous, discrete, etc. So the setting we have chosen is that of quantum statistical mechanics. And more specifically of ZD translation invariant quantum spin and fermion systems. So the mathematical foundations of quantum statistical mechanics were laid down in 1960s and 70s. And I have listed here some classical monographs starting with David's statistical mechanics and then uh, a very encyclopedic summary of this golden age of quantum statistical mechanics, 60s and 70s can be found in two volumes of Raffaele and Robinson. Sorry, progress. Sorry? And do you hear me? And then- yeah, uh, everything's fine. And then, uh, so, so I mean, these are the books. There are many other monographs, of course. I mean, I'm just listing one that, uh, that I have read that have influenced me. And the last, the last uh, reference is actually the paper by Araki and Moria. I have listed it here first. It's over 100 pages long, and by its nature, it's almost a monograph. But I have listed it here because, I mean, because of its importance, because it uh, fully extends the thermodynamic formalism of quantum spin systems to lattice fermion systems. And for many years, such extension was lacking in the literature. And thanks to this work, all of results I will talk about hold simultaneously for spin and fermionic system on the lattice. The only difference is that in the fermion case, one has an additional conservation law related to gauge invariance of particle density, and that's it. So in this talk, I will focus on the lattice quantum spin systems, but with a few additional comments, all the results extend to lattice fermionic systems. So let me just mention a few reviews which are more recent and sort of the reviews, there are many, many reviews I have chosen the ones which are sort of in the spirit of the, this talk and in the spirit 
of, uh, of the paper that we are finishing. So the first review is by David Royal, Topics in Quantum Statistical Mechanics and Operator Algebras, which beautifully written and sort of concerns a more recent development, although it's not 20 years old, and could be found on the archive. It was not published. Then I am another one that is dear to my heart is called the LAN Review on Quantum Dynamical System for 2006. And there are two reviews that were written in various collaborations with Yoshiko, Jan Pautra, Claude Alain, and myself. Now, the mathematically rigorous works on the zero slope and approach to equilibrium, in a sense that I will study it, in the sense that we will study it, are actually very scarce. So, first, I'm mentioning the work of David Ruel from 1967 because the specific question that we will address in the end of the talk is actually posed in that paper. And so I will come back to that a bit before I formulate theorem. The papers, the pioneering works of Lanford Robinson and Hultenholz really played an important role for us. We were very much inspired by them. There is a, a little, maybe not so well known paper by Suhoff that uh, Suhoff was building on his previous work with the Brushin and has proven, a, has given a technically different derivation of the main result of Lanford and Robinson from 1971. This is an important paper because of the techniques it uses. And I think it should be further studied and I'm sort of advertising it. We will study it, for sure we will study it and we plan to go further with that. And the last work I would like to mention is by Erdos, Samhofer, and Yao on the quantum Boltzmann equation. In this uh, work, the authors give an analysis of possible routes to derivation of quantum Boltzmann equation in relation to Hugenholtz's work. And uh, sort of, I will stop with listing the references here. I should say that uh, there are many other works on the quantum Boltzmann equation, but I'm just listing here the ones of the Hugenholtz and Erdos van Hofriot, because those are the ones we were, that we're motivated by those. Okay, so let me now start with the quantum spin system setting in which we will address the problem of approach to equilibrium, and more specifically, the question of well from 1967. So I will go slow, relatively slow. I mean, we might have an expert audience here. So the set of spin sites is taken to be the lattice ZD. And to every site X, we attach the single spin Hilbert space HX, which we take to be C to the M for some fixed M. We denote by F the collection of all finite subsets of ZD. So this is the set of all finite spin configurations. And to spin configuration X, actually, I don't know, do you see when I point out the, the cursor, we associate a Hilbert space, which is just a tensor product, the spin, the, the Hilbert space associated to the spins located at the sites in the big X. So this is just a tensor product. We have no statistics of uh, H small X, but X is in configuration set big X. And of course we have, algebra of observables that is associated to the configuration X. It is just uh, the usual sister algebra of matrix algebra of all linear maps from HX to the HX equipped with the operator, the usual operator node. Now, if X is contained in Y, then algebra UX is identified with the subalgebra of UY in a natural way just because you can identify HX with a subspace of HY. And uh, using this identification and usual process of the completion, you can sort of co you construct the sister algebra U of spin system simply by taking a union of all UX is identifying them according to the inclusion that I have mentioned and then making a completion. It's a fairly standard procedure that is sometimes called the inductive limit of sister algebras over the family UX. So this uh, UX, where X is finite, are sometimes called local algebras and the elements of the UX are called local observables. Now we will denote by S the set of states 
on u. Oh, let me just mention that the algebra u is simple. It has no two-sided ideals. It is separable. It has a unit. So it is sort of a nice object from the, from the mathematical point of view. So we denote by S the set of states on U. So this is positive normalized linear functional on U. They, they describe the physical states of the system, the non-commutative analogs of probability measures. And of course, in our setting, we have a group of translations of the lattice ZD that extends naturally to our algebra U that by translating the observables and then by duality extends to the set of all states. So we denote by SI the set of all translationally invariant states. So this is a piece of notation. So lambda to denote the box centered at the origin in ZD. So lambda going to ZD would mean that the size of that box goes to infinity. We can take a one holder limit and so on, but it will restrict to the simplest possible set. So now we introduce the specific entropy of a translational invariant state that plays, of course, a fundamental role in thermodynamics, in thermodynamic formalism. formalism. So we start here with a translationally invariant state. We restrict it to the box, so we restricted it to the algebra U of the box. So this is a matrix algebra, this is a density matrix. So it's von Neumann entropy minus trace rho lambda logarithm of rho lambda is well defined, so negative. And then specific entropy of rho is just von Neumann entropy per unit volume. So here we have a size of the box lambda, number of the points of lambda, and we just divide von Neumann entropy of the restriction with the size of the box and take a box to the ZD. And this limit always exists. It takes values in zero logarithm M, where M was the dimension of the single spin Hilbert space. And the map, the entropy map, which associate it's associates to rho, its specific entropy S of rho is uh, affine, that is S of the convex combination is a convex combination of S's. And it is upper semi-continuous. I didn't mention that basically one always equips S with a weak star topology, then set of invariant states is closed in the weak star topology, S is compact in the weak star topology. And so the entropy map is upper semi-continuous. So these are very, very old results that go back to the 19th end of the 1960s, to basically to Robinson and Robinson and Lanford. Now, so this you find in any book, of course, uh, what is a little bit less common is the notion of the specific relative entropy, and that will be central for my talk, for, for our results. So, this, so we again take two states, which are translational invariant, but this time, after we restrict them to the box lambda, we don't look at entropy of the restriction, but of the relative entropy, which is defined here, so the Nagaki formula, that S of rho lambda omega lambda is trace rho lambda, and then we have logarithm rho lambda minus logarithm omega lambda. This is always bigger or equal than zero, so it is a sign that is very important. And then if the limit of the relative entropy of the restrictions per unit volume exists, we call it the relative, specific relative entropy law with respect to omega. The limit may fail to exist. And also it may take value plus infinity. So the definition assumes that the, that the limit exists. If the limit exists, or you take a lim in, you always end up with a number that is bigger or equal than zero. And that plays a role. So now we go to a notion of interaction. So we will deal only with the trans translational invariant interactions. So here we have the, the translation, the, this interaction is described by the collection phi of x, where phi of x is a, an operator, self-adjoint, which is in our local algebra u of x, and which describes energy of the spin interaction of the spin in, uh, located at the configuration x. 
So this is just energy of the, of the, of the spins that are located at X. And of course, we need to make some assumptions in order to have thermodynamic formalism. One can make a various assumptions, different results calls under different regularity assumptions. Here I make one that sort of covers them all, just not to introduce different assumptions along the way. But so here is the assumption. It is the assumption that what we call here norm of phi of r, which is just sum zero in x, and then we have exponent to the r number of the points of x norm phi of x less than infinity. So when size of the configuration gets large, we have an exponential exponential decay. So I mean, so this is, I mean, I will not discuss technicalities when precisely this is used and so on. This is sort of a fairly standard assumption when one wants to discuss dynamics of the spin systems. So the set B of R of such interaction, the interactions that are translation invariant and satisfy this property is a Banach space. So from now on, the intera interaction always will be in beta of R. Let me introduce a local Hamiltonian. Once we have energy of a configuration, we can introduce a local Hamiltonian. We fix a box, and then the local Hamiltonian of the box is just sum over the energies of all configuration x that are contained in the box. So it's just sum x contained in lambda v of x. And once we have a local Hamiltonian, we also have a dynamics. So I just wrote here one line about that. So basically you fix a local observable A, sort of observable that depends on the finitely many variables. Then you evolve it in the Heisenberg picture with respect to the local Hamiltonians H lambda. If A is fixed, you take sides of the box to infinity, to the ZD, and then this limit will exist uniformly for 10 compact sets will define a flow on the local observables, and then by continuity, will extend to the flow on C star algebra U, which is going to be C star dynamics, which will be continuous in the norm of our spin algebra U. So again, this is very, very standard, goes back to the late 1960s, and we will start with that. Now, if one would like to talk about equilibrium, one first here to before discussing maybe approach to equilibrium, one needs to specify what one means by equilibrium. And for us, equilibrium will be always thermal equilibrium that is characterized by the KMS condition of the Hag, Hugenholz, and Winnick, going back to 1967, a foundational work, statistical mechanics. So it is, so the definition goes like follows. We fix inverse temperature beta, this is a mouthful if you have not seen it before. And then a state omega is called tau phi beta KMS state. So tau phi is dynamics, beta is the inverse temperature, or we just say thermal equilibrium state at inverse temperature beta. If the map, correlation map for every A, B in our algebra, we have a correlation map T going to function big F of A, B of T, it is just omega of A, and then we evolve V with the dynamics, the time T. So if this function has an analytic continuation to the strip, zero less than imaginary part of Z less than beta, so the analytic continuation is in T, that is bounded and continuous on its closure and satisfies so-called hubo martin schringer boundary condition, KMS boundary condition, if you take analytic extension to the point I, I beta, T plus I beta, then you just reverse the roles of B and A in the first line. You just have that this analytic continuation is equal to omega B sort of cyclic property up to analytic continuation that uh, it's omega and T B involves the time T multiplying A. So this is a profound definition. So see, 160 pages in Bratelli Robinson volume two are devoted to mathematical and physical aspects of KMS state and KMS definition. So it's mathematical importance partly stems through the connection with Tomita Takesaki modular theory of operator algebra, which incidentally was developed at exactly the same time as Tomita has given his famous lecture 
1967, and Takesaki book appeared 1970. So th this connection goes around very deep and uh, in hands of Araki and others have led to fundamental insights to structure of quantum statistical mechanics. So here I will mention only two that I will discuss later in the talk, but there are many, many others, the list is also very long. So I just mentioned here Araki's Gibbs condition, that is quantum analog of the Bruchin Lanford well conditional equation, and played a basic role in the formulation of the Gibbs variational principle. That is my next topic. And then Araki's relative entropy of two states on sister algebra, that is again cannot, cannot be introduced or studied without modular theory, and that uh, extends this relative entropy of two density matrices that I have defined a second ago. Now we have introduced a thermal equilibrium state via KMS condition, but they also can be characterized by Gibbs variational principle, and that came later in 1970s. And to describe it, I need to recall some basic definitions. So we need to introduce a pressure, pressure of heat, free energy, and specific energy. So the pressure, so we have our interaction phi, we have inverse temperature beta. So pressure of beta phi is just usual definition, limit when the size of the box goes to infinity, one over the number of the points in the box and logarithm trace of inner minus beta h lambda phi. This is the Gibbs canonical ensemble associated to the Hamiltonian h lambda in the box. So this limit will exist. It will be continuous function of the phi and so on. This is again proven by Robinson, I believe. And then next, first by Robinson, you can find it in any book now. And then uh, we have a specific energy observable. So the specific energy observable is the contribution of one lattice side to the energy of interaction phi. And it is defined by the following formula. You just sum over all configurations that contain zero, you take energy of the configuration and you divide with the number of the points in X. So this of course converges under our assumption and convergence of this is actually sufficient condition to develop thermodynamics to a certain extent. And this specific energy observable has a very important property which is easily proven that if you take any translational invariant state, any, and then you look at the expectation value of the energy in the box with respect to that state. So you look at omega of the local Hamiltonian divided with the size of the box, this limit will exist. And it's exactly going to be the expectation value of the specific energy observable in the state of the So we have a pressure, sometimes called the free energy. The usual convention is to divide P of beta F with the beta and change sign. But but let's not worry about that. And we have a specific energy. So here is the Gibbs variational principle, which is uh, an amplification of the finite volume Gibbs variational principle, which is an easy exercise in linear algebra, but this is a profound fact. So the Gibbs variational principle is telling us that if I, for my fixed interaction, if I look at the pressure of beta F, that, we, that is a supremum of all translational invariant states. And now we have a difference of the specific entropy times beta times specific energy in the state row. The set of maximizers, which are called equilibrium state, is a non-empty, and not only that, but it's a non-empty convex compact subset of the set of all translational invariant states its extreme points are ergodic with respect to translation. And that's actually if and only if state it has a beautiful convex structure. And of course, if you're in the finite volume, the maximizer is unique. It is the Gibbs canonical ensemble, but for infinitely extended systems, the set of maximizers may not be singleton. And then the, the maximizers or extreme points of the set of maximizers are pure phases, and one would like to understand the structure of this set, and that is the problem of phase transitions. One basic result is that for 
high temperatures, that means for small beta, the set of equilibrium states is a single top. So there are no phase transitions at high temperatures. Now this connects with the KMS condition because omega is equilibrium state, maximizes the Gibbs variational principle if and only if omega is a translational invariant KMS states, tau phi beta KMS states. So this is fundamental result. First came the KMS condition, then came the Gibbs variational principle. So this is the result is due to Robinson, Lanford, and Araki. So they took a while to prove it. So Araki introduced his famous Gibbs condition in order to prove the last part. And this is precisely the quantum analog of the classical Gibbs variational principle established by Ruel, Lanford, and De Bruyne previously, where the KMS condition was replaced, of course, by the De Bruyne Lanford Ruel condition. So, so, so far, I have primarily spoke about the developments in 1970s. I will now turn to what one can call more recent development, at least comparatively speaking, and these are the developments of the last 25 years. So this, they will serve as an introduction and motivation to what I will turn hopefully very soon to. So those developments were primarily in the dynamical set. So they were not in a stationary setting I have discussed a second ago, but the Gibbs variational principle connecting to the KMS condition was the central result. And uh, they concerned two basic topics, the topic of uh, problem of return to equilibrium, that is actually an old topic, goes back to Robinson in the year 1983, and development of non-equilibrium quantum statistical mechanics that is more recent, and in a sense, I will talk about basically started in 1991. So here it's good to have a picture about specific, specific physical situation that this uh, new results, so to speak, were sort of applying to, and they sort of motivated the entire theory. So this is the model of open quantum systems, if you wish. You have a small system S, by small one means in a finite volume, so that's described by Hilbert space is finite dimensional, which is coupled to several independent thermal reservoirs, which could be one, which are in thermal equilibrium at certain temperatures. So the reservoir RK is in thermal equilibrium with temperature beta K. We know what the thermal equilibrium right now, now is, is described by KMS condition. So the state is initially in a product state. You take an arbitrary state of the system S, it's finite dimensional, it's like any density matrix, and you know what is the state of the reservoir. It is described by KMS condition. It's always convenient to assume that here we are at a high temperature, so we have a unique KMS state. And then one has interaction between the system S and the reservoirs. The reservoirs never interact directly. And it's here it is very important that this interaction is local. So system S interacts by some local interaction. If this was a spin system, this would just depend on the finite region of the, of the lattice describing RK, our observable describing interaction will be, will, be, will be local. And so this is the setting that one should, can, can have in mind when looks at these recent developments. And there are two cases one considers here. The case one, when we have a single reservoir, and then if you have a single reservoir at some temperature beta coupled to a small system, then this reservoir one expects under normal conditions drives the small system to the thermal equilibrium state at the same temperature. It drives uh, from any state, it will drive the S to the Gibbs state in a minus beta H. S where normalized where H S is the Hamiltonian of the small system. So, the, I mean, this is sort of an obviously intuitive fact, like measuring uh, body temperature with a thermometer. So the thermometer just goes to the temperature of the body. And that is the return of the equilibrium in Robinson picture. It is exact analog of ergodic problem in classical dynamical system theory. And uh, equally difficult, uh, there is a non-commutative structure. So it is uh, a little bit richer, maybe from a mathematical perspective. 
in the classical problem and the works that have been done in the last 20 years primarily focused on sort of exhibiting concrete examples, concrete physically relevant models for which one does have a return to equilibrium. The, the foundational work has been set by Robinson and others in 70s and 80s. The second question of non-equilibrium actually required the foundational developments. And in that case, one has several reservoirs at different temperatures. And then the system, as time goes, settles in some non-equilibrium steady states, not in an equilibrium because there are reservoirs at different temperatures. And in that non-equilibrium steady states, there will be a steady heat flows one expects between the different reservoirs across the sample S. And so, so here is a picture. You have a hot reservoir, you have a cold reservoir, and that I have quantum mechanical. You can think about them as a quantum spin systems, maybe not translational invariant, because translational invariant, invariant is actually not very natural here, but it doesn't matter. And you will have a heat flow from a hot reservoir to the cold reservoir in the limit, steady heat flow as the system relaxes to the steady state. And this is actually because there is not enough time. I mean, there has been a large body of work on these two topics, approach to equilibrium and foundations of non-equilibrium quantum statistical mechanics. You can find references in these review articles that I have listed on the second slide, I believe. And I will focus here only on briefly on, the, on reviewing the non-equilibrium quantum statistical mechanics because it would serve as a motivation for the, and comparison for what I will discuss in a second after that. So non-equilibrium statistical, non quantum statistical mechanics can start with a picture that we have here. And you again have some quantum dynamical system that describes it. There is a C star of algebra of observables. This is the tensor product of the corresponding algebras. There is a dynamics which is just a combination of the dynamics of individual systems with a perturbation that connects S to each of the reservoirs. And there is initial states, which we assume just to be a product state, an arbitrary system, state of the system S, coupled to the reservoirs, which are all in thermal equilibrium. And this is our O tau of omega. And now the basic object of the theory are non-equilibrium steady states. David Ruel called the natural non-equilibrium steady states. He just, Claude Alain and I called them just non-equilibrium steady states. And these are weak star limit points of the net. You start with your state, you evolve it along the trajectory and then you average over the time. And then you look at the weak limits as T goes to infinity. If the algebra O was separable, that would be the limit just along the subsequences Tn going to infinity. And this set is always non-empty because of the compactness and its elements are invariant under the time evolution tau. So this def definition is really motivated by the SRB, Sinai Ruel Bowen definition of the, of, the, of the physical measures in the non-equilibrium set. And then associated to this definition, there is something that we call entropy balance equation, namely that if I look, how does the entropy changes in time? And here the entropy is actually the Arrakis relative entropy that I have mentioned. And this is just an extension to the infinite dimensional setting of the formula trace rho log rho minus log omega that I have written before. But then to define it, one needs a modular theory that this is not entropy per unit volume. This is really direct extension of the finite dimensional relative entropy to infinite dimensional setting. Then if you look at the relative entropy, Arrakis relative entropy of the state evolved to some time big T with respect to omega, how much relative entropy has changed. Then this is integral from zero to T. And then he, here you have expectation value of time evolved very specific observable sigma. And this sigma is the entropy production observable. Now, if you go back to our physical setting, if you spe specify to this type of the models, then of course you, ex you expect 
sort of have intuition what sigma should be, there, there, there will be observables that describe energy flow from S to each reservoir. They're just defined by the commutants of the Hamiltonians of S and Hamiltonians of the reservoir. Now you can say Hamiltonian of the, of the reservoir is not well defined, but commutators are well defined and this will define entropy, the, the, the energy flux observable. And if you have this physical setting, then it's turned out this abstract definition reduces exactly to what you expect. It will be just the sum of beta K energy flux observable, the energy flux to the case reservoir from the rest of the system. There are some boundary terms here, which do not really matter. They depend on the initial state of the small system and they disappear in any limits that you, meaningful limits that you can consider here. So this is sort of uh, when the 2001 that works, uh, that we started to work on this, this entropy balance equation was the starting point of uh, Claude Alain and myself. And this uh, direct physical definition was the starting point of, uh, of David Ruel in the two, two parallel papers that we have written in 2001. Now, once you have the entropy balance equation and you have a definition of a non-equilibrium state, and you have a sign of Arrakis relative entropy, Arrakis relative entropy is just any other relative entropy is not negative, you immediately get that in a non-equilibrium state, non-equilibrium uh, stationary state, the entropy production is non-negative. So this is just saying that heat flows from hot to cold and you would like to know, know much more. And so, so here are these basic goals of the non-equilibrium program that started in 2001. So first one would like to have a results, theoretical structural results, and then also the theory, when is the non-equilibrium steady state a singleton and when one has a strictly positive entropy production. Then there are really flows flowing through the system. The second question one would like to ask after the first one is answered is uh, whether the linear response theory holds, whether we have onsage reciprocity relations for the heat flows, whether the fluctuation dissipation theorem holds. And then one would like to go further, one would like to study a large deviation principle in the convergence to the entropy production. And one would like to understand the quantum analog of the Galabotic coin fluctuation relations. And so in 20 years, sort of there've been a a lot of work and there was a resulting theory which is first structural because that did not exist before. There is a rich structural theory which is deeply linked to the modular theory. And there is a detailed study of concrete models of physical interest. This theory was actually applicable to the, the Pauli field systems where one could get enough dynamical information to actually get a non-trivial results. So, I should say that this uh, quantum theory was very much motivated by the developments in the non-equilibrium statistical mechanics in classical setting, based on the classical dynamical systems, the work of Galavotti and many others in 19th, in particular the definition of entropy production observable and uh, non-equilibrium steady states was built on those developments. And there is a beautiful review of David from 1999 that was to some extent our starting point. This entropy production observable that is introduced via this, by this relation is in a certain sense is not uniquely defined because of non-commutativity. The expectation values are not affected by the definition. All different possibilities will have the same expectation value, but uh, different choices will have a different structure. And one particularly sees that to the quantum Kalavotti coin fluctuation relation, they will be true for one specific choice and uh, different choices have different physics, different mathematics and sort of this is now fairly mature theory sort of uh, we understand it I think reasonably well on the foundational level and maybe one of the main open questions in understanding non-equilibrium statistical mechanics of these models is to sort of enlarge the class of concrete models to which it applies. And now I can discuss problem, finally the problem of approach to equilibrium. So I will discuss it in the setting 
I have introduced, we have in a, we are back now to the spin systems on the lattice ZD, the translational invariant setting. We start with the translational invariant state. We fix interaction, we have a flow, and then we look at the time averages of the state omega along the, tra time, along the trajectory. So basically you start with a translation invariant state, which could be far from equilibrium, far from any, and then you let it flow under the regular enough dynamics. And then you want to see whether it approaches to some, what, what are the limits as t goes to infinity. And so those limits of, this, of the net of these averages, we call the equilibrium steady states. So they're weak star limit points of the net omega bar t as t goes, as t goes to infinity. The set, is, the set of equilibrium steady states is always non-empty because by compactness argument and its elements are invariant under the flow. They're also translation invariant because the flow is translation invariant and omega is translation invariant. So now we have a definition what do we mean? What, what is that that we would like to study? We would like to study those equilibrium steady states. And the aim is sort of similar to the one that we had in 2001, when one started with the development of non-equilibrium theory, one would like to study the structural, structural theory of equilibrium steady states, and eventually determine if they exist conditions under which these limiting states will be KMS states for a dynamic style T. If this happens, then one will have a phenomena of approach to equilibrium. One would have justifications of the zeros law that you start with some translational invariant state that is far from equilibrium. You evolve it with respect to regular dynamics and the system will relax to the equilibrium states with respect to the dynamics. Now this looks similar to the non-equilibrium setting, but it's actually quite different. So it's, uh, for example, you can consider a case of a particular interest where the initial state we start is actually equilibrium state, but for some other interaction psi. It's not a restriction at all because any translational invariant state will be an equilibrium state for some interaction, but that interaction has to be in a big space of interactions if you just start with any. And uh, it might not be unique, there might be all problems from the physical point of view. If you start with a, with a big spot is known, let me just be vague, the big space of interaction. But we are just assuming that this initial state is actually nice enough for the beginning and that it is an equilibrium state for some interaction psi. So system is in equilibrium with respect to some dynamics and then under the flow, it should change to another equilibrium. Now the difference here between the interaction between equilibrium and uh, the non-equilibrium statistical mechanics and approach to equilibrium, if you wish, is that this difference phi minus psi is not a local perturbation of dynamics tau psi with respect to which our original state is in equilibrium state. So this is, so this is a global perturbation and this global perturbation is supposed to, to change the state globally at any instant of the time, the state will be mutually singular with respect to original state. The Iraqis relative entropy will be infinite at all times. So this is sort of much, much bigger perturbation than we have in the non-equilibrium setting. And the physical picture one has behind is quite different. Although certainly the, this non-equilibrium development serves as a motivation for what I'm talking here. So there are conservation laws that accompany the setting that I have. So if you start with any translational invariant state and then you evolve it, what happens is that its entropy, specific entropy doesn't change. That specific entropy of omega is actually the specific entropy of omega evolved at any finite time. And then it's a trivial exercise to prove that the same Thing holds for the ergodic averages with respect to the time, as long as big D is finite. So this is an old result of Robin, Lanford and Robinson from their fundamental paper from 1968. It is in the last section of that paper. 
keeps being rediscovered for one reason or another. Uh, there is a, another conservation law, which we were sure it was known. And if it is known, please do tell us because sort of we do not want to <laughs> repeat the same mistake, like to keep rediscovering stuff. It is that one also has conservation of en specific energy that if you start with any translation of invariant state, then it does not change if, if you evolve the state in time t. It's completely intuitive because if you formally differentiate, of course, you get that this is true. But the rigorous mathematical proof has to take into account that one is dealing with infinite systems and the proof we have is actually technically harder than one for the Robinson result, although the statement is more inf intuitive. The same result holds for the, for the averages, of course. So if, so if, if you do no reference for this result, it should have been known for 50 years, just uh, the drug drop is a no. We don't know, we don't have a reference. And an, an immediate consequence of the conservation laws is that if now I take T to infinity along some subsequence, if I converge to some equilibrium steady state omega plus, then of course energy gets cons conserved. So this is the, here phi is the specific energy of the dynamics. And uh, we have inequality for a specific entropy because specific entropy is only upper semi-continuous, not a continuous function. So that is of course very important. So in the limit, S of omega plus of equilibrium steady state is bigger or equal than S of omega. And so here comes the point, the question that we ask ourselves as a first point, as a first question of understanding approach to equilibrium, as a first question of sort of getting any structural theory, one can ask, is this, is this approach to equilibrium in this sense accompanied with a strict increase of the specific entity? Namely, whether we have that here strict inequality that S of omega strictly less than S of omega plus. Now, this turned out to be a question. I mean, you know, this is a very natural question. And, uh, and we learned that this question was actually posed in uh, 1967 in, by David. And in the paper I have mentioned, the very, very beginning of the talk, so he had the following sentence. It is unclear to the author whether the evolution of an infinite system should increase its entropy per unit volume. Another possibility is that when time tends to infinity, a state has a limit with strictly larger entropy. So a year later, Banford and Robinson proved that at least in a quantum spin set setting for finite time, the entropy per unit volume does not increase, stays constant, constant. But now one has a question whether it jumps at infinity or it does not jump in infinity. And one actually, one, when you face this problem, one can also, it is possible that this question does not have a general answer, that you have to go to a concrete model. So in the context of the concrete models, this may or may not be true, but it might not be a consequence of the general structural theory of equilibrium statistical mechanics. So for example, if you look at the strict positivity of entropy production, this is not a structural question. One can find a condition under which this is true or not, but that condition are typically of the dynamical nature and they have to be checked in a concrete models and they're typically very hard to check. So here, the general theory just gives you a condition under which you can prove it, but you have to go to concrete models. So a priori, it is not clear whether the question of well, because he posed the question 50 years before we looked at it, is, uh, can be answered purely structurally or simply you have to look model by model and depending on the, on, the, on the regularity of the model, it is true or it is not true. So before we offer our answer, I have to sort of make a short digression to the concept of weak Gibbsianity. So weak Gibbsianity is a concept that arose in dynamical systems uh, and it goes back to 2001. To the work of Yuri, it's a concept that is very popular and very much used in the uh, in, uh, theory of dynamical systems, in particularly in study of uh, multifractal theory. 
it uh, has been used in statistical mechanics, classical statistical mechanics, but perhaps not as much. And one can find the various definitions of the weak Gibbsianity extending the usual notion of Gibbsianity as we know it. So sort of it is sort of rooted in the DLR equation, but it is sort of remarkable that the founding fathers did not extract this definition. It is an extremely useful definition. It is sort of implicit in the, uh, you, you read uh, Ruel's book, Thermodynamic Formalism, it is there. It was just not extracted as a separate definition one should work with that generalize the concept of Christianity. So I will not go into classical theory here. Uh, I will just say a few words. So we will set beta equal to one, then we will absorb for notational simplicity the, the temperature constant of the interaction. So right now the high temperature correspond to the small r norm of the interaction phi. And a translation now in variant state is called the weak Gibbs for an interaction phi, always in our beta r regularity class. If it's sort of bounded above and below in the box by the Gibbs canonical ensemble e to the minus h lambda phi, and this is just a normalization factor. And this constant that bounded from, this is operator inequality, that bounded above and below, we have a property that when lambda goes to infinity, when lambda goes to zd, logarithm c of lambda, of lambda volume, number of the points of lambda goes to zero. So it is quite an intuitive definition because I mean, sort of, you could think it's related to the Gibbs condition, that sort of you restrict system to a box up to a boundary term, it should be given by the Gibbs canonical ensemble. And uh, that was not the motivation, I think, from the dynamical systems point of view. And this is just an ad adaptation of one most popular, so to speak, classical definition of weak Gibbsianity to the quantum set. So any, Gib any weak Gibbs state is equilibrium state for phi. If D is equal to one in one dimension and phi is finite range, or D is bigger or equal than one, and we are at high temperature, Speci specific estimate is that R norm of interaction has to be less than R, then any equilibrium state for phi is weak Gibbs. However, it is not known, we do not know, and I, we believe it's a very hard problem to prove that for any R positive and any interaction be regular enough, the set of equilibrium state is equal to the set of the deep state. So we have only high temperature result and high dimension uh, and one dimensional result. One dimensional result is basically due to fundamental estimates of Iraqi, but one dimensional system from 1961. And for D bigger than one, bigger than one, bigger than one the, the, this result, perturbative result, high temperature result uses a Gibbs condition. We need the Gibbs condition to analyze it, to prove it. In classical setting, in the setting of classical spin system, this is known. It was been known, it's, first, it's not that hard to prove, but uh, Pfister and Sullivan has a very general result. If you sort of don't want to work, if you can go to subshifts and extremely general sub, subshifts, subshifts, subshifts to sort of have some hardcore interactions and so on, you have uh, the that for any summable interaction, the set of equilibrium state is equal to the set of three Gibbs states. But this is not known in quantum setting, even for phi in BR. And sort of, we have a theorem that the proof of the equality could be reduced to better understanding of Araki Gibbs condition. So, so there are some basic questions that are open in quantum statistical mechanics. It's quite basic question that, uh, that we do not understand. So, so the sub, so all the, it's part of source developments I started with, we still do, still do not understand some basic things about quantum statistical mechanics, especially in relation to the dynamics. The second question which you can ask that if you start with a Gibbs, big Gibbs states, is it preserved under the dynamics? Even if the constants here can get horrible, if you evolve the state, does it remain weak Gibbs? And this is known only for a short time, as time gets larger, one loses the control. Now, so why this weak Gibbs condition is so natural to us is because of the entropy balance equation. 
So remember this, the entropy balance sort of played a fundamental role in uh, non-equilibrium statistical mechanics and sort of appears here in a very different form. And the form which it takes is the following one. If you start with a weak Gibbs state for phi, that is sort of almost Gibbs, if you wish, according to the definition which I have given, then for any translational invariant state rho, if you look at the specific relative entropy of rho with respect to omega, so this is just relative entropy of the restrictions to the box per unit volume, you have a formula. This limit exists and it is equal minus specific entropy of rho plus expectation value of the specific energy in the state rho and then plus breath pressure of phi. So this is sort of almost immediate from the weak Gibbs condition. And another result which is immediate is, uh, we always know this is bigger or equal to zero, but as rho of omega vanishes, if and only if rho is an equilibrium state for phi. So the only thing that we need is actually this relation for our result. The only thing that we need is that specific relative entropy is given by this formula. But uh, we could give state a sort of natural passage between, between the two things. So sort of one can postulate it, but weak Gibbs condition is really naturally connects what one would like to, to have here. So here is our first theorem, Dawa Drouhal's question. So suppose that we start with a state which is not invariant under the flow. Because if it is invariant, then everything is completely trivial. There is nothing to talk about. So if state is not invariant and we end up in some equilibrium steady state that is weak Gibbs, then the entropy has to jump at omega plus, then the S of omega is strictly less than omega plus. How much? We don't know, but it has to strictly jump. So we have, we have discontinuity of the entropy plus infinity. But this is a conditional result, unfortunately, because I am assuming that omega plus is weak Gibbs. So in high temperature, at least omega plus would have to be the equilibrium state for phi. That means that we will have, that we do have approach to equilibrium. So if we do have approach to equilibrium in the sense that the limit is KMS state for phi, then the entropy has to jump. The only problem is that we do not have any examples for that except the quasi-free fermionic dynamics results due to Langford and Robinson and some exactly solvable elementary spin system examples. So if relaxation to thermal equilibrium does happen, then unless everything is completely trivial, it has to be accompanied by the strict increase of the entropy, specific entropy, but this is a conditional result. We have a second theorem, which is not a conditional result. But right now we make a condition on the initial state. Now, if you assume that omega is weak Gibbs and is unique equilibrium state for some interaction psi, so we are in a high temperature regime. We start with a state psi, uh, omega, which is in, a, in equilibrium with respect to some flow, in, and we are in a high temperature regime. And we assume that things are not trivial, namely that our state omega is not invariant under the flow that is supposed to drive it to equilibrium. Then for any limiting state omega plus, we have a strict increase of entropy. So right now, so this is now applicable to many situations because the assumptions are on the initial state and not on the final state. Wherever you end up, the entropy has to jump. So that provides sort of partial, at least partial answer to the, to the question of, well, I think uh, one may hope to improve it a little bit, but I mean, it's natural to start with a high temperature regime for this question. This is not questions about phase, phase transition. These are questions about dynamics. So, so I don't think this is, this is very restrictive. So just make, make me some remarks. So it is perhaps surprising that we have a, here a strict increase of entropy as a structural feature of quantum statistical mechanics. Here we heavily use the entire structure of the, of the equilibrium quantum statistical mechanics. One uses Gibbs condition, one uses uh, 
one uses the Gibbs variational principle and so on. But it was not obvious, at least from us, from the beginning that one would, as I said, that one does not need to go to concrete models to get strict increase that it is actually a structural feature. What is certainly not a structural feature, feature is approach to a thermal equilibrium state. So this remains an open question and this presumably can be fully answered only in the context of concrete models. And that's where the derivation of the Boltzmann equation that uh, Hugen holds and, they, and later on Erdos, Samhofer and Yao worked on is perhaps the first step, this Van Hovelini in which first order of perturbation theory gives you, first non-trivial order of perturbation theory gives you the right result. Now we have a relation, this should be one, two, and three, sorry about that. We have a related set of results. It's a separate paper and a separate uh, talk. Uh, in the time-dependent translation in the variant adiabatic context, a bunch of no-go theorems that follow the line of thought that we have here and basically assert that the time-dependent adiabatic theory does not extend to the translation invariant context if one wants to have zero slow and approach to equilibrium. So, that, so this is just a short advertisement for the next. So, so, so this is just the first step in the research program. It's obviously they were starting to work on that that deals with this fundamental problem of approach to equilibrium in quantum statistical mechanics. So 20 years is maybe a bit long time from our perspective, but maybe some young people will pick up on that. And this is a, a part of broad beyond Gibbsianity program that Claude Alain, Armand and I are developing over the last five years that was sort of very heavily affected by the COVID crisis, but we were all affected by that. And I have given several talks about that or different aspects of this program that are listed here and the uh, recordings are available. So this last slide is just an advertisement for postdoctoral and PhD position. If you're sort of interested in these topics, would like to work on them, let us know. So I stop here. Thank you very much, Vaigan, for this uh, very nice and uh, very clear talk. Um, is there any questions or comments from the audience? So I think I have one actually. Oh, oh sorry, Hal, maybe you wanted to ask a question. Oh yeah, but this is a simple question. So, uh, so theorem two looks very powerful. So can I understand that it gives many examples of the strict increase of entropy in the final step? Because you can start from any. You can, yeah, exactly. That. You can start with any high. You can start with any high temperature state. Right. Right. Then you just evolve it, and whatever weak limit you have, unless you're trivial, then it, then entropy has to jump. How much you don't know. So I mean, there's no qualitative estimate, and, and so on. it is sort of, it is it is just sort of a structural result. Yeah. Yeah. It is just SSL. Yeah, but you can just choose a different Hamiltonian, then of course it's the original. Okay. Uh -huh. Beautiful. Thank you. May I have a question? Yes, please, Jan. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, if I remember in this business, one often assumes the analyticity of some of, of, of the dynamics. So, uh, so in, in, the, in these two theorems, uh, do, do you assume some kind of analyticity? Uh, I mean, we don't use it. Uh, but analyticity, if you wish, comes in a certain sense from the assumption that the states are in the, that the interactions are in this beta of R. So because interactions are in beta of R, the way the proof of the existence of the dynamics goes, it shows that for a local observable, A, the dynamics actually has an analytic extension. So oh, okay. okay, so so, uh, so this assumption BR implies analyticity. Implies analyticity. But I sort of, uh, I, I think kind of, I think these results are more stable. I think uh, as long as you have a Gibbs, the Gibbs variational principle is what plays a crucial role in combinations with the weak Gibbsianity, because sort of this weak Gibbsianity 
And this entropy balance equation that we have here really sort of allows you to have a starting point to go down, to kind of ski down, not to go up. And, uh, and, uh, and I think that it is, uh, this analyticity is not used in the proof, it's sort of implicit. And I think that presumably under, as long as we have a weak Gibbsianity and as long as we have a Gibbs variational principle, the result will be, will be true. So, so do, do you think that one can relax this condition, uh, B, BR? Uh, I think, I, I think, I think, I think it could, I mean, you cannot relax it too much, but I mean, as long as, I mean, you can make it axiomatic, as long as you know the dynamics exists and has a certain regularity properties and the Gibbs variational principle is satisfied, then the theorem is true. So, so the Gibbs variational principle is a consequence of of, of this BR condition or? The, well, the, the, the way the proofs, the proofs are written, yes. Now you can, I mean, because it guarantees the existence of dynamics and sufficient regularity. But I, at least that's the way the, way the proofs in Bratelli Robinson are written. I, I mean, I think Araki Moria proofs, I think follows pretty much the same lines. So, so I think, uh, I, I think if one, I, I, I mean, I think kind of, uh, to answer your question, I think if it is an answer, I think the central issue would be here, kind of if one really would like to understand things better, it is that whether the set of, when you forget about phi in BFR, you can say for each set of interactions, the set of equilibrium states is equal to the set of big Gibbs states. That does not have to do with the existence of a dynamics. This is sort of a kinematical question. This is the question, if I start with a translation invariant state, I restrict it to a box. Is it approximated above and below by the Gibbs canonical ensemble in the sense I have written it? And you can ask the same question for a set of interactions that are just summable, for which, uh, for which basically you do have a well-defined thermodynamics, the set of interactions for which you know that you only have finite energy per spin side. And classically, that is true. Now, I think our that is my personal opinion that our understanding of the quantum dynamics is so poor and it's basically they have not progressed since early 1970s and late 1960s that we, we, we cannot answer it. So, 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 it, so it is just, a, so it is, a, so if the further progress to be made is sort of in understanding better the quantum, the quantum dynamics. Uh, and another question. Uh, do you have some cl classical analogs of these theorems or the... Uh, okay, so that, is, so that is an excellent question. Uh, so, the, so, 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 so first one, one would need to sort of have a good setting. So we have to have to the setting. A natural setting here would be the setting of the lattice ZD, where at each side you put an anaharmonic oscillator that is coupled, let's say, to the nearest neighbors, just like you, you have it in Fermi pasta or not. And then you can ask that then dynamics is known to exist by very general results of uh, Landford, Lieb, and Labovitz from 70s. And then one can ask the same question. And, uh, and I think the strategy will work. We have, a, we have a postdoc at the moment working on that or planning to work on that. I think he's listening, Reno. And uh, the problem a, a bit is that we are using here a lot of structure that in this setting is either not known or it is only implicitly known. So one would have to clean up sort of a little bit the literature, uh, like for example, the, the conservation law that we have used here. The, so the, these two conservation law are used heavily. And then uh, uh, the Lanford Robinson result would have to be extended to this setting of coupled harmonic classical oscillators on the lattice ZD, I think is true, probably with a very similar proof, but it has to be done. Sort of all these inputs that we use, I mean, I, I discussed them with Arnold Van Enter, who is also listening, I think. So, so it's, I think uh, the set of ideas should extend to the classical. I think there is a big difference there if you want to go beyond, because so, so proving this result in classical setting, I believe is doable. But I think it will be easier to go in quantum setting further. I think that uh, in classical setting, if you want one would like to go further, then, then, then 
certain, I mean, certain questions are maybe easier classically and certain are not. So for example, I believe that it's in classical setting, it's easier to understand Vedic Egyptianity and that Vedic Egyptianity is preserved under the flow. I'm pretty sure it's true classically. It's very hard quantum mechanically, but there are certain things that are easier quantum mechanically the way setting works. You know, you worked on this stuff, so. And so, uh, uh, by classical, you mean Hamiltonian, not not uh, stochastic. I always, here I always mean Hamilton. Okay, great. Thank you. Other questions? I just have a quick question on this notion of weak Gibbsianity. Just wondering yeah. what's weak about it. It seems like a fairly strong condition, actually. Well, uh, you see, so so. Uh, if you look at the classical systems, right? And then, uh, so in classical systems, uh, I mean, you could, you could, so the, the natural boundary in, in classical theory for, uh, for, uh, for a nice thermodynamic thermo, uh, the formalism would be the summable interactions where you have a Dobrushin plan for the well equation. Now you could have, uh, weak Gibbs states, which are not described by the, you, you start, so, so, so to, uh, where, where the interaction that you have here is not in a small space of interaction. So sort of, so they're not gonna be the, the, uh, the brush in land for Druel, but they are gonna be still weak Gibbs. So this is more general than Gibbsianity one is accustomed to, to the, the brush in land for Druel. I see, thanks. It, it is a little bit, I mean, I mean, I think Arnold is an expert on this. I mean, uh, I mean, and one can construct such examples even in one dimension, by, by yeah. Then one ends up with, the, I mean, actually, if you're interested, this, I discussed this example precisely in this talk in Milan, uh, based on the, it's a, they're based on matrix products and uh, hidden mark of chains, if you wish, and in the, in, the, in the language of counter examples to the, uh, renormalization group theory that Arnaud and collaborators have discussed. They're called the decimation process. So and maybe uh, th this weak weak Gibbs uh, condition uh, is it interesting in the classical case or it's only absolutely. Or... absolutely. I mean, uh, I mean, actually, it was never to my knowledge it was never discussed in quantum case. But that's in classical case. That's where the literature is. That's where it was introduced. And, and who, who introduced it for the first time? So the, the, it was first introduced in 2001 by Yuri in the context of the dynamical systems. And, and as I said, I mean, kind of it is, if you have a summable interaction phi, then this condition is basically immediate from the Dobrushin land for the real theory. It is just never stated in this form. But once you write it in this form, first you realize it's a more general than the Brushin Lanford theory. Then it is very stable in a certain sense. It's easy to work with, it's natural. I mean, that it is easy to work with, you sort of see from this entropy balance equation because you, you get it almost right away from the definition. And once you have it, then, then you can proceed by sort of combining things. And sort of, the, and here the question is, looks an obvious question, but when you start to think about that, it's actually a non-trivial question to show that, that the equilibrium states satisfy that. You would say how that's possible that they do not. But uh, I think that proving the conjecture is actually quite an interesting problem. Yeah, but uh, still, still I think uh, that the name is kind of strange. Uh, we keep states, I mean, so every week Gibbs state is an equilibrium state. So, so that's, equi well, I well, mean. The, the, the question is here kind of, uh, kind of what do you mean by Gibbsianity? So people often by, by Gibbsianity would mean that, uh, you, that uh, you have the Bruce and Lanford Ruel equation. And here, this condition can be classically can be true without having the Bruce and Lanford equation. So it's more just it's kind of that, that is sort of so sort of if you naively think about classical theory, this big Gibbsianity sort of sets a natural boundary for existence of thermodynamic formalism, which shares all the regularity properties of the usual thermodynamic formalism except for the DLR equations. 
And on this slide, the, an equilibrium state uh, means that a KMS state or? Yeah, this is, this is, this is what we had on this slide. Uh, that uh, the equilibrium states mean that you maximize Gibbs variational principle okay. or equivalently your translational invariant KMS state. This is equivalent from 70s. And sorry, can I ask you a question about the, actually maybe just to repeat the comment you made about the Abiabatic theory on slide 23, right? Yes. So you were saying that that would not fit the picture somehow, right? Or yeah, that's what this is. This is something that, uh, yeah, so let me go into that. Uh, yeah, so this should be comment free. Sorry, I sort of, uh, I had to change my slides. Uh, the, uh, you can ask the question, so, so, we, so uh, adiabatic theory at the moment, we understand, of course, very well in a, in a, in a, in a quantum mathematical, in, in quantum, usual quantum setting that, starting with the work of Cato and then continuing with Avron and Elgert and so on. And then there are extensions to the quantum statistical mechanics that are very important that are due to Jurg and uh, Abu Salem, his student, and also Kodalan and I had the same results at the same time. And then one can, but so this adiabatic theory uh, at positive temperature uh, always works with respect to the local perturbations. And it's sort of, uh, Proof is basically reduced by a modular theory to an application of the avron elgert theorem. It is uh, quite quite a nice theory. It uh, follows from the it's a basically combination of Araki's perturbation theory of KMS states and avron elgert theorem. But it's for local perturbation. At the zero temperature, we have the result of uh, the rock, and then. Uh, let me untie it now. So, sorry about that. Uh, and the collaborators, if you remember, Bachmann Martin Fry, Fry. Bachmann and Fry, good friends. Uh, they, they prove a diabatic theorem at, uh, at, uh, at uh, zero temperature. So now, now our question, but once we started, this was kind of one, it's not clear whether a diabatic theorem makes sense at, uh, at positive temperature at all, because you know you have an infinite amount of energy at your disposal. So what does it mean going slow once you have an infinite amount of energy at your disposal, right? Kind of if you have a local perturbation of KMS states, you have a fine, you sort of you have a finite energy at your disposal relative to the equilibrium state. At zero temperature, you can think you have finite energy at your disposal. And so there, there was some intuition which I understood from Martin that people actually did not expect the diabatic theorem to be true uh, that you have that that you sort of have uh, its natural extension to the translation invariant setting and that happens to be the case so we have a bunch of the results essentially no go theorems that they which they say that it, if a diabatic theorem holds along the trajectory then entropy has to stay constant you cannot and, and so basically you can, you, you, the adiabatic theory in translation invariant setting is incompatible with the zero slope of thermodynamics. It's a question of the order of limits. Do you first take a thermodynamic limit and then adiabatic limit? If you first take a adiabatic limit and then thermodynamic limit, you get a far good theory. The usual intuition is you should do the opposite. But if you do the opposite, you actually get a theory which is extremely restrictive and so essentially non-physical. Okay, thank you. Other questions or comments? Yes, yeah, I have a question. So there are many physicists, including myself, who are studying this problem of approach to thermal equilibrium in a large but finite quantum systems. And uh, those studying integrable system found that some integrable spin chains do not thermalize. I mean, because of many, many conservation quantity, uh, you start from something non-equilibrium translation invariant, but it converges to something they call generalized Gibbs state, which is not Gibbs, so which is probably not KMS. I don't know, but that's, that's for large finite systems. So do you expect the same thing for infinite system formulation or something changes? 
So, I, so that, that is again an excellent question. So, so if you look at the uh, if you look at the question of uh, of the problem of approach to equilibrium, so so the problem is mathematically well posed. So we start with right. a transition invariant state, we evolve it, and we ask there are limits, and we would like to understand those limits. Now, these limits. We actually do not know whether equilibrium statistical mechanics in the setting of quantum spin system can actually produce thermalizations or not. Mm -hmm. it is, so, so I mean, the only examples that one have that this happens are quasi-free quasi dynamics of Lanford and Robinson. And one also has a very strong indication that the results will be true to the first order of perturbation theory for uh, fermionic systems on the lattice with the nearest neighbor interaction. Then you get quantum Boltzmann equation, which at least you expect to. So, in, and then you're looking only at, at a two point function with energy, right? So, so I think that uh, the, the, the exchange of the limits, if you first look at the large time limit and then thermodynamic limit, that of course gives you a completely different field. So I think that, uh, I think the question is widely open. Kind of, you know, okay. sort of. I mean, it is a, the, it, the phenomena is true, right? We know that system is true. Sure, the, question, sure. the question is whether whether the given mathematical framework can capture. It. So they have, so the quantum statistical mechanics captured so many things. So, so the, does it capture the approach to equilibrium, or we have to look at scales, and then maybe on a certain scales we see it, but on some other scales we do not. Or we just see it exactly like we see relaxations to non-equilibrium state, and I think that is widely open. So we just have this a very preliminary result, but uh, the first step in this program, if you wish, to which the answer could be negative in the end. That, but uh, that maybe the, maybe there is no thermalization, strictly speaking, in the in the context of. Uh, it could be interesting to talk to founding fathers, to to Robinson and. To, to whether they, or now it's too late to hug, uh, what would be their intuition about that? Yeah, I don't know whether it answered the question. Yeah, thank you. And there was a question in the chat, which I think was uh, referred to the um, weak uh, Gibbs states. It was, what are the realistic physical systems that exhibit these states? Oh, but uh, the, any high temperature state is weak Gibbs. Yeah. So. That's it. In dimension one and finite range, any state is weak Gibbs. Yeah. In any high temperature state is weak Gibbs. And we expect that any equilibrium state is weak Gibbs. So basically anything, <laughs> as much as quantum spin systems are realistic, then, then they are just realistic. Yeah. Um, other questions? It doesn't seem to be the case. So let's thank again, Vargan, for the, for the very nice talk. Thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you very much, Vargan. It was nice to see you all. <laughs>